Welcome to Lake Coxway United Methodist Church and this service of worship on the first Sunday uh, during the season of Lent. The only announcement I want to really call your attention to is to announce that there will be a administrative council meeting on April the 7th after coffee hour. So those of you who are on the administrative council, I hope that you will plan to be present for that meeting April 7th uh, after coffee hour. Are there other announcements that I need to make? So there's a date I didn't real. I thought we were good for, so I hadn't looked. At, so we do need a host or hostess on March 24th if someone uh, feels led, and we'll look at the sign-up sheets when we go into fellowship hour after worship. That would be great. Any other announcements? If not, the reason we have gathered to uh, worship is to serve and worship a risen Savior. So let us stand as we share in the greeting. When Jesus was in the wilderness, he was tempted to save himself. Jesus was offered salvation if he turned stones to bread, if he accepted wealth and power, if he tested God's commitment to him. May our commitment be as strong. May our lives be placed in God's caring hands throughout our journey. And our hymn of praise is hymn number 64. Please be seated. And may we continue as together we pray the opening prayer. 
Lord, we come to you this morning with so many concerns and issues that demand our attention. Our lives are burdened, our spirits are tired. Guide our and our steps as we walk this Lenten journey, inward and outward. Help us to discern what you might do, that others may be healed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You have the appointed scripture passages for the day uh, before you in the bulletin. I would invite you to follow along as together we read and hear God's appointed word for this day. The Old Testament lesson comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, excuse me, chapter 26, verses 1 through 11. In um, Exodus, we read that the Israelites were encouraged to give the first and best fruits of the harvest to God, and this reading in Deuteronomy expands on that idea and reminds uh, the Hebrews that their offering was to be in thanksgiving for their deliverance from Egypt. So let us give attention to this lesson. Once you have entered the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and you take possession of it and are settled there, take some of the early produce of the fertile ground that you have harvested from the land the Lord your God is giving you and put it in a basket. And then go to the location the Lord your God selects for his name to reside. Go to the priest who is in the office at that time and say to him, I am declaring right now before the Lord my God, that I have indeed arrived in the land the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. The priest will then take the harvest from you and place it before the Lord your God's altar. And then you should solemnly state before the Lord your God, My father was a starving Aramean. He went down to Egypt living as an immigrant there with few family members. But that is where he became a great nation, mighty and numerous. The Egyptians treated us terribly, oppressing us and forcing hard labor on us. So we cried out for help to the Lord, our ancestors' God. And the Lord heard our call. God saw our misery, our trouble, and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and an outstretched arm with awesome power and with signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land full of milk and honey. So now I am bringing the early produce of the fertile ground that you, Lord, have given me. Set the produce before the Lord your God, bowing down before the Lord your God. Then celebrate the good things the Lord your God has done for you and your family. Each one of you, along with the Levites and the immigrants who are among you. Herein ends the Old Testament reading. Our Psalter reading is from Psalm 91, and we will read it responsibly. Living in the most high shelter, camping in the almighty shade. Because you've made the Lord my refuge, the most high, your place of residence. Because he will order his messengers to help you to protect you wherever you go. And you'll march on top of lions and vipers. You'll trample young lions and serpents underfoot. Whenever you cry out to me, I'll answer, and I'll be with you in troubling times. I'll save you and glorify you. you 
And the epistle lesson comes from Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 13. It really does not need an introduction. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message of faith we preach. Because if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and in your heart you have faith that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Trusting with the heart leads to righteousness and confessing with the mouth leads to salvation. The scripture says, all who have faith in him won't be put to shame. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek because the same Lord is Lord of all who gives richly to all who call on him. All who call on the Lord's name will be saved. Herein ends the reading of the epistle. Will you please stand for the reading of the gospel? As is the custom of the church, always on the first Sunday of Lent, we read the story of the temptations or the temptation. This is not the only temptation of Jesus, but a particular time of temptation for Jesus. So let us give attention now to the reading of the gospel. Jesus returned from the Jordan River full of the Holy Spirit, and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. There he was tempted for 40 days by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and afterward Jesus was starving. So the devil said to Jesus, Since you are God's son, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus replied, It's written, People won't live only by bread. So next the devil led him to a high place and he showed him in a single instant all the kingdoms of the world. The devil said, I will give you this whole domain and the glory of all these kingdoms. It's been entrusted to me and I can give it to anyone I want. So therefore, if you will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, it's written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And the devil brought him into Jerusalem and he stood him at the highest point of the temple. And he said to him, since you are God's son, throw yourself down from here for it's written. He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. And Jesus answered, It's been said, Don't test the Lord your God. After finishing every temptation, the devil departed from him until the next opportunity. This is the word of God for the people of Christ. Thanks be to God and remain standing and we will sing our hymn of preparation, hymn number 504.
about the season of Lent, we will pray a prayer of confession each Sunday. So I would invite our attention now to the prayer of confession. And before we join in unison, I would ask and invite us to first quietly and silently confess our individual sins. Let us pray. Now let us continue as we pray. There is a certain winter in our spirits today, O Lord. We feel that the journey on which we have embarked will demand too much of us. There are so many other things in our lives which claim our spirits, our energy, our hopes and fears. It is easy to be like Jerusalem, turning our backs on those whom you send. The world shouts its solutions to us and then deserts us when we are in need. Forgive us for the many times in which we have strayed from your pathway of life, when we have chosen not to hear the cries of those in need, when we have belittled the gifts and skills you have given us in order to avoid serving others. Heal us, O Lord. Place us back on your path to Jerusalem to live. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear these words of forgiveness. Our hope and assurance rest in God's unfailing love and forgiveness. Open your hearts and minds and souls that the healing waters of God's never-ending love and forgiveness may flow into and over you. Know that in this love and forgiveness, you have encountered the living God. Thanks be to God. Amen. It's a story old as time. And no, that's not a Disney movie, even though there is a song that is popular in a Disney movie that some of us know. That tale as old as time is the story of humanity versus the devil. Some of you know a story that begins like this. It's a story that they tell in the border county where Massachusetts joins Vermont and New Hampshire. Yes, Daniel Webster's dead, or at least they buried him, but every time there's a thunderstorm around Marshfield, they say you can hear his rolling voice in the hollows of the sky. And they say that if you go to his grave and speak loud and clear, Dan Webster, Webster, Daniel Webster, the ground will begin to shiver and the trees begin to shake. And after a while, you'll hear a deep voice saying, Neighbor, how stands the union? So begins a story that they tell in New England. You know it, the devil and Daniel, Daniel Webster. Kathy knows it. It's the story of a poor New Hampshire farmer. His name is Mr. Stone, who after years of bad luck and barren land remarks, it's enough to make a man want to sell his soul to the devil. And soon after, the farmer, Mr. Stone, meets a stranger named Mr. Scratch, yeah, also known as the devil himself. And Mr. Scratch, the devil himself, makes a deal with Mr. Stone. Long story short, it's not long before the devil comes to get his due. And at that point, Mr. Stone calls upon Daniel Webster, you know, the famous orator, politician, to defend him. And of course, as the story goes, 
Mr. Webster defends Mr. Stone with his quick wit and oratory power, and he saves Mr. Stone's soul. I grew up with another story. It was kind of a song. Some of you from the South will know this song, I hope. I'm not going to sing it for you, but the devil went down to Georgia. He was looking for a soul to steal. He was in a bind because he was way behind and he was willing to make a deal. Any of you know Charlie Daniels' song? Tells the story of Johnny who outplays the devil on the fiddle, remember? And wins the devil's golden instrument. Our literature, our music, our folklore is full of stories. It's odd to me that in a world where it's acceptable to doubt the existence of the devil, to doubt the existence of the devil as a concrete being, our culture and our collective memory still have these stories because they hold on to a very important concept. Evil exists. The world is not perfect. And evil wants our souls, our very identities. And the stories of our Literature, our music, recognize that evil tempts us to go back on everything, to abandon who we are, to portray all that we are committed to, all that we love, and usually only to gain something just for ourselves. That's the part of what is broken about us. We even love imperfectly. And sometimes we are willing to sell our souls for, quote, good, end quote, purposes or reasons. Often we are willing to argue that a seemingly positive end justifies a destructive means or I might want to say an evil twist. We have a tendency to sometimes go back on our principles, especially when we face extreme situations. You know, like having not eaten for 40 days, Or living in very treacherous times. The cry of Daniel Webster was, How stands the union? Which, by the way, probably could be translated, How stands your neighbor? In the gospel story today, Jesus contends with the devil. And if we read this in a cursory way, it would be easy for us to think it's just a tale like all the other tales we have around evil and the devil. One where someone contends with Satan and someone defeats him or wins. I mean, there are similarities. I mean, if someone is offered everything for what he immediately needs, like in this case, Jesus is offered everything for his immediate need of food to Jesus being offered world domination and great power, but all in exchange for Jesus going back on everything God has 
called him and made him and given him to do. In an act of desperation, however, remember that it's an act of desperation on the devil's part. The devil offers Jesus a chance to put the doubters to rest once and for all by defying gravity in front of scores of worshipers at the temple in Jerusalem. If the ends really do justify the means, you could say that the devil gave Jesus an opportunity. Come on, the devil says to Jesus. Come on. You can do this the hard way. Or you can take the easy way. You don't have to starve. You don't have to deal with all those religious authorities or the Roman Empire. They're going to kill you. They're going to be angrier and angrier with you. They're going to hang you on a cross. And you're just going to be another dead Jewish rebel. The devil hinting, whispering to Jesus, who at this point is in a weakened state. But of course Jesus, by God's power, resists the temptations and he quotes scripture in order to expel or repel the devil. Jesus refuses to give up or metaphorically, to sell his soul. And unlike other characters and stories we tell, this divine story of God doesn't have Jesus tricking the devil or even outperforming him. Note that. Because it would be tempting to celebrate Jesus' victory over temptation here as an end to itself. Wishing that you and I, that we, could resist the devil as well as Jesus did. We are tempted to think this story is like all the other stories. One to emulate. But as Daniel Webster and Johnny in the song prove, It's never been impossible to outsmart or outmaneuver the devil. And though we tend to get very proud when we resist temptation, don't we? And that becomes a sin in and of itself, by the way. The devil's a self-defeatable character, by the way. Do you hear that? The devil is a self-defeatable character. He's always, for us, a very defeatable character. Because we live in the power of the Holy Spirit. But the devil always returns. For an opportune time. Luke's gospel clearly points that out. Even Jesus. Who faced these three temptations. And it's recorded for us in the gospels. Even Luke's gospel tells us. The devil doesn't go away. He waits For another opportune time. And the next time 
may even be a more desperate time. Like perhaps when Jesus was arrested by the authorities. And can't you hear the devil just again whispering in Jesus' ear? I told you, you're going to be just another arrested Jewish rebel. They're going to beat you up. Who knows what they're going to do? They might even throw you up on a cross. So no, this story in Luke's gospel is not a typical contends with the devil story. There is more to the story of Jesus in the wilderness and Jesus and his temptations than you and I should resist the devil also. Also remember, on the night in which Jesus was arrested, Judas betrayed Jesus for money. Peter will deny Jesus out of fear. While we humans can resist evil, even on our own, our own power sometimes, we have a distinct tendency not to resist evil. Especially when we're desperate. Especially when we feel threatened. Especially when we act out of fear. Especially when we refuse to do good to others. Yes, it's true. Some of us can outsmart, outtalk, and occasionally defeat evil. But too often, we don't. And no matter how many times we reanalyze this story of Jesus and his resistance to temptation, no matter how many times we make resolve to resist temptation, we often don't resist temptation. One of my friends says it a little too casually, I think. He says, I sin as soon as my feet hit the floor in the morning when I get up from bed. I respond back, I hope it's a little longer than that. We don't tell the story of Jesus' victory over Satan in the wilderness to, to mourn our own defeat. We tell it because Jesus did far more than Daniel Webster or Johnny or a lifetime of resent, resisting temptation ever could. Jesus didn't outsmart evil. Despite and even in the midst of human, feet, uh, human failure, Jesus defeated evil once and for all. By going to the cross and setting us free from the claim of sin on our lives and the claim of death on our lives. Because it doesn't matter if you and I by our human devices defeat the devil. Because ultimately you and I are mortal. And what does that mean? It means ultimately I am going to die in this earthly body. That's why the Jesus story is different. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed... While humanity stood outside giving in to evil and fear, Christ gave himself up for us. He faced a mock trial. He was 
beaten, cursed, and spit upon. He was nailed to a cross. He died, was buried, but he arose again by the power of God to conquer once and for all evil and to provide for us freedom into eternal life. Big difference between how I resist temptation and how Christ overcome it, or overcame it, excuse me. So we continue in the journey of Lent following Jesus, knowing that some of us have taken on Lenten disciplines, perhaps some of us taking on a way to try to stop some sin that we have a particular bent to do. But let us do it knowing that that is simply a discipline. That the real work of our salvation has already been given to us in Jesus Christ. And that is the story of redemption. The story of the devil and Daniel Webster ends. They say that whenever the devil comes near Marshfield, even now, he gives it a wide berth. And he hasn't been seen in the state of New Hampshire from that day to this. Well, my sisters and brothers, because of Jesus the Christ... May evil give us an even wider birth. And may we remember that it is not we who contend with evil. It is Christ who has already defeated it. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Now, if I can find my bulletin, we'll continue as I invite you to take your hymnals and turn to page number 881. Stand as together we affirm this historic confession of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascendeth into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Please be seated. We continue together in worship as we offer our prayer concerns, believing that God invites us to pray. Um, I'm going to invite you, if you'd like to join me at the altar, you are welcome. Um, And I'm also going to invite you to say out loud particular names and situations that you might want to remember in prayer. So let us prepare now with hearts and minds as we together join in this chorus.
God, we come now to you in prayer. And by sentence or perhaps by just calling a name out loud, we offer our needs and our prayer concerns to you. Susan and George. My brother David. Mildred. My wife's aunt and uncle. The family of the nine-year-old who died a little over a week ago and who buried their beloved son this week in Brevard. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers And hear us as we continue to pray as Christ, our brother, taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue to gather in worship as our ushers come forward to receive our tithes and our offerings.
And let us join together as we pray the prayer of thanksgiving. God of all goodness, we thank you for your blessings, more numerous than the stars, more bountiful than the greatest of harvest, more steady than the beat of our hearts. Here we dedicate our gifts and rededicate our lives to your vision of hope and wholeness. May all that we do and all that we give be pleasing to you and a testimony to your loving purposes. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And our closing hymn is hymn number 384. I'm thankful that I don't have to worry about really trying to defeat the devil. I am called to live more fully into Christ and to resist temptation. But I know, and I pray you know, that evil has been defeated by the power of Jesus Christ and his outpouring of love by offering himself for us. So let us go knowing that in spite of evil around us, it has been defeated. And that we are children of the greatest king. We go in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.